Hi, I'm Hull History Nerd and on this episode of the Lost Villages of Hull we're going to be taking a look at a village that technically is a lost village of Cottingham. This is the story of Newland. This, behind me, the busy intersection between Beverley Road, Clough Road and Cottingham Road used to be the very centre of the hamlet of Newland. And Newland was actually one of Cottingham's outflung parts of its parish, a small hamlet that was not close enough to Cottingham to be considered part of the village itself, but certainly within its catchment area for its parish, rather like Skidby, but unlike Skidby, Newland was a much more diffuse parish. Yes, the Cochin Inn used to stand here, the Hereworth Arms, right on the corner where the modern pub still stands today. But there weren't really very many houses around here. Instead, the parish of Newland was spread out. It was more diffuse. It was mostly agricultural work, farms, spreading along Inglemire Lane, Endike Lane, and even southwards as far as the Newland Tofts, which today are probably better known as the Avenues. And it's quite ironic that this is the first video that I've done on the Lost Villages where the village centre is still probably about as busy a thoroughfare as it used to be in the Middle Ages, although granted busy in those days means a very different thing to busy now. But the Cottingham and Beverley Roads would have been very busy by medieval standards. Lots of trade, lots of agricultural work and of course lots of dignitaries travelling between the two places. But, of course, being a part of Cottingham, it wasn't the absolute centre of the small village. Whilst there was a small chapel here, St Mary's in Cottingham was still the parish church. If you wanted to get married, christened or buried, you'd still have to travel up the Cottingham Road to the big church to do so. Likewise, if you wanted to trade your fruit and veg, you'd travel up that road to Cottingham's market. In the Middle Ages, the Cottingham Road would have more or less followed the path that it does today, although it was much straightened during the land enclosures from the 17th century onwards, right up until the point where it reaches the kink in its length, where today it meets Bricknell Avenue and the little country lane of Snuff Mill Lane. For centuries, what we today think of as Snuff Mill Lane, however, used to be the western end of Cottingham Road, and this stretch still exists partially as it would have been hundreds of years ago as a small muddy country lane. But as Cottingham's population centre shifted and enclosures made newer, straighter roads to those population centres, Cottingham Road instead hooked north from this point and headed on to meet up with New Village Road to the north. If you want to know more about this fascinating relic, I did a whole video on Snuff Mill Lane that might be worth checking out. Likewise to the east there was another small hamlet that was considered part of Cottingham, a place known as Hull Bank. On the edge of Newland and, as its name suggests, on the banks of the River Hull, this settlement was gradually absorbed by Newland over the centuries, but Hull Bank was the seat of Benjamin Blades Hayworth, whose name lives on even today in the heart of what was ancient Newland in the aforementioned Hayworth Arms. Newland's neighbour to the east, Skullcoats, was the first old village in the area to feel the growth of the burgeoning town of Hull in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, as detailed on my video on the lost village of Skullcoats. It was quickly industrialised, parts of it annexed to build grand Georgian townhouses on the edge of Hull, the rest of it crammed with slums to house the workers of the industries that were crammed along the river corridor. Newland, however, being a little further removed from the River Corridor and being part of the more highly regarded parish of Cottingham, became one of Hull's earliest middle-class suburbs, 
with wealthy merchants building large, grand houses here, along the south side of Cottingham Road and up along Beverley Road, some of which still stand today, including the remodelled 18th century farmstead turned country home Edrington House on Beverley High Road, an almost unique survivor from this period in Hull's history. Perhaps one of the grandest buildings left from the mid-19th century is the great house once known as Ensley, which was soon turned into a convent and which these days is luxury apartments. Later in the 1870s further west, Newland Park was developed by William Botterill as a somewhat exclusive set of houses for the well-to-do. This estate, rather like the avenues which we'll look at in just a moment, grew over the next 50 years or so, encompassing a wide range of architectural styles, including Victorian Gothic, Edwardian and arts and crafts inspired builds. While some slums did grow up off Beverley Road, Newland, in general, had a much more refined image as a place where the modestly wealthy could go to live, away from the smoke and stench of the bubbling industrial cauldron that Hull was fast becoming. In 1850, much of Newland was still fields, and what would later become Princess Avenue and Newland Avenue were one boggy country lane known as Newland Tofts Lane. Named after the swampy fields to the west, Newland Tofts. The 18th century saw some significant drainage improvements to the area, however, with Beverley and Barmston Drain and Cottingham Drain helping to reduce the swampiness of the land, particularly in this area. This southern part of Newland saw very little development, but as Hull began to expand and the land became less of a quagmire, and Zachariah Pearson built his People's Park and surrounded it with magnificent houses in the 1860s, Princess Avenue began to take shape. The whole area began to change and one of Hull's most well-known areas slowly began to form, the avenues. The four lanes that would become the avenues were laid out by a developer called David Garbutt, and the site was opened for development in 1875. When the avenues first opened in the 1870s, it was mostly empty fields. Certain parts of it had been built, of course. There were a few rows of houses at the sort of eastern end of Marlborough Avenue and Westbourne, and a few independent houses that had been built here and there on plots that had been bought. But the avenues wasn't populated anywhere near as quickly as the original designers had intended. In fact, it would take about 60 years for these streets to fill with an eclectic mix of architecture from various different ages, which is what makes the avenues such an interesting place to go for a walk, because you have Edwardian buildings rubbing shoulders with Victorian Gothic ones. You've got 1930s houses sitting right next to 1880s ones. It's a fascinating place to walk and a fascinating place just to look at the rather extravagant and wealthy architectural detailing that was placed on these houses designed for Hull's middle classes. No holds were barred. I mean, we have Juliet balconies that don't even have a door behind them, just a sash window, for instance, just across the road there. It's great. It's, I love wandering around and just looking at the houses around here. Loads of things like Queen Anne Revival, Gable Ends, and ah, oh, it's amazing. And of course then there's Salisbury Street, which seems to have been originally designed to slice across all four of the avenues with a roundabout and a fountain at each intersection. And whilst Victoria Avenue never got its fountain, Marlborough Avenue never got its intersection. Salisbury Street, for some reason, never made it that far south. So it doesn't actually have a junction with anything other than, well, Marlborough Avenue. It's an odd roundabout that just sits on its own in the middle of Marlborough Ave and has no apparent purpose. And those fountains were designed to echo the ones along Princess Avenue, one outside Pearson Park and the other just at the junction with Blenheim Street and Park Grove. And those fountains had arisen as a result of the group building up of Princess Avenue during the 1860s and 1870s as a result of the construction of Pearson Park where Zachariah Pearson had created his People's Park and then populated it with very high-class dwellings all the way around the perimeter to try and attract the, uh, the middle classes of Hull to move out here where Hull met the countryside, because in those days it really did. Now the boggy nature of the Newland Tofts fields upon which all of this was built would, in later years, come back to haunt the avenues. In the 1970s, it was discovered that 
a lot of the houses, their foundations were subsiding because of the way that the ground underneath was drying it unevenly. And I still remember walking through here in the 90s and seeing houses, beautiful old houses with huge wooden beams supporting the walls as remedial work was done on them all. Property prices fell through the floor in the avenues and as a result a lot of them were bought up by developers who turned a lot of them into flats. But what that means now is that the avenues has a fantastic and eclectic mix of residents. It's curiously a place that seems to attract academics and teachers but also because of the flats it also attracts a lot of Hull's more creative types so there's a lot of musicians and writers and artists who live in the avenues. It has a curious feel to it that I've always really quite liked a sort of fizzy creativity about it and it remains the only place in the world where I've ever had a car drive past with 1970s Pink Floyd blaring out of the windows bonus points for that. At the western end the avenues came to an abrupt halt at a ditch beyond which were fields that ran almost uninterrupted all the way out to Willoughby and Cottingham. But as Hull continued to grow this ditch ended up becoming a road, Chantelands Avenue, named after one of the fields that it was built on known as the Chantelands. Other fields in the area included the Ewlands and the Harpings. Originally Chantelands Avenue came to an abrupt halt at the embankment of the Hull and Barnsley Railway to the north, but in the 1920s a bridge was built under it to allow it to carry on north towards Cottingham Road. This is one of the few bridges that the old Hull and Barnsley Railway crosses that wasn't built during the construction of the railway, and because the embankment was at a lower level here, precisely because it didn't have to cross a road when the line was built, and there was no easy or cheap way to raise the level of the railway to allow the road to easily pass beneath it, Chantelands Avenue had to be dug into a dip under the embankment in order to pass, which is why the dip in the road level still exists to this day, and also why it tends to flood so easily every time Hull has a major storm. Today people still come to wander around the avenues to look at the sheer variety of architecture from so many periods on display and with the annual avenues open gardens event you can also get to see these marvellous houses from the other side and their gardens as well. The avenues themselves are a nice place to pass through, those now very mature trees that line it make for a pleasant walk and on a still warm summer's day you can hear an almost constant low level buzzing from the armies of bees hard at work in the gardens and among the leaves of all those trees. On a more personal note, I have absolutely no personal history with Newland, but I've made one. I've always been fascinated with the avenues ever since I walked through it on my way backwards and forwards from town to Cottingham. And in my 30s, I moved around into the area, I lived here for nearly 16 years, which means that my kids now have a family history here. Their recollections are all based around Newland, whether it's going to school down Thorsby, whether it's going to Pearson Park on a weekend and popping into the conservatory to look at the fish and the axolotls, or whether it's wandering with me around the avenues to look for the, the sculptures made out of old dead tree stumps. Their family history is here. But I moved here on a whim. Unlike my ancestors who moved to Drypool to be close to their place of work and who stayed in Drypool to be close to their family network of support, I think this is a profound change in the way that we have lived our lives and the way we move around the city and where we choose to live. We don't have to live within a footfall of our place of work anymore. We don't have to live next door to our grandparents because emergency grandparent babysitters these days are just a quick phone call and a bus ride away. And I think that's an interesting thing demographically and also for our personal histories. Families have become more widespread, more scattered. They don't have to live within a couple of streets of each other anymore. You can pick up a phone and talk to relatives you've not spoken to for months just at the drop of a hat. Plus, it gives people an opportunity to sample different parts of the city that perhaps they've never had any history with, like me developing my own history here in the avenues. It's nice to wander around my old stomping ground and visit a few old haunts.
Newland didn't entirely escape industrialisation, especially the stretch of it that ran along the riverbank. In the 1840s, a waterworks was developed on the north side of Clough Road. Drinking water had always been something of a problem for the town of Hull, mostly being sourced from springs around Anleby and Cottingham, and as the population was exploding, this was fast becoming a serious issue. It was believed that the water from the River Hull, as long as it was captured during an ebb tide, would be perfectly fresh and drinkable once the silt and clay were separated. It seems that the chaps responsible forgot that the effluent from Hull went upstream during the incoming tide and then flowed back out with it with the ebb. I'm not saying that this waterworks caused the cholera outbreaks in Hull that followed its construction, but enough people did think that, that an alternative was quickly sought. An artesian well was sunk at Spring Head with a pumping station built over it, a building that still stands today and which still supplies the Kelgate water plant in Cottingham with much of Hull's drinking water. Along Clough Road, there was also apparently a pottery known as Kingston Pottery, shown on the Ordnance Survey map next to the bottle works. I mean, it's fair to say that compared to Skullcoats and Stone Ferry, Newland got off lightly when it came to industrialisation, mostly being confined to the area next to the river. Naturally, of course, the area had a strong and influential lobby against industrial development. After all, many of the wealthy and most powerful people in Hull lived in the area, and their opinion held more sway than those in the poverty-stricken working-class areas of Skullcoats or Mighton. Thus, much of Newland was regarded as a more high-class residential area, and thus not available for industrial development. But this growing population meant that Newland wasn't going to stay part of the parish of Cottingham for much longer. By 1862, the population had gotten so large that it was split off and formed into its own parish, with this 1832 church, St John's, located on Clough Road, these days tucked away behind Sainsbury's on Hayworth Junction, as the new parish church. Of course, Newland's newfound independence wasn't going to last for very long, because only 20 years later, in 1882, a date immortalised on the railway bridge across Newland Avenue, Newland would be absorbed by the town of Kingston-upon-Hull and became part of its property. But this wasn't the only church, because the population was still growing after 1860, and massively too, particularly with the growth of Newland Park and the avenues. So a new church, St Augustine's, was built, right at the top of Queen's Road and Princess Avenue, to service the needs of the avenues parishioners. That didn't last that long into the 20th century, however, and it was replaced by St Cuthbert's on Marlborough Avenue. Looking after the parishioners' spiritual needs wasn't the only concern, however. Perhaps even more important was transport, and Newland was served from 1853 by a railway station called Cemetery Gates that would carry passengers to Paragon Station in one direction or to Victoria Dock via Stepney, Skullcoats and Southcoats in the other. This station would go through a few name changes before settling on being named after the nearby Botanic Gardens. In the late 1850s and 60s, it would also become a gateway to the seaside as the branch lines to Withensea and Hornsey spun off from this short Victoria Dock branch line. In 1885, the Hull and Barnsley Railway opened, crossing over much of Newland on bridges over several streets including Newland Avenue, but not having any stations in the region. The closest station was Beverley Road, near the bridge over Beverley Road itself. And then, of course, came the trams. Originally only reaching along Spring Bank to the southern end of Princes Avenue on the 1870s, by the 1900s the network had expanded up Princes and Newland Avenues and up along Cottingham Road, where a major tram depot was constructed to service and stable the trams. By the 1920s, they spread along Chantelands Avenue too, providing easy to access travel for anyone in the avenues or along Cottingham Road. Whilst now the trams may be long gone, pretty much the same routes are still plied today, by buses. Another development of Newland that was to take place in 1913 happened right here, when the city built a municipal training college. This rather grand set of buildings on Cottingham Road, just opposite Newland Park. And then, a decade later in the 1920s, next door, the very first buildings of the University of Hull started to be constructed. This cemented Newland as the centre for further education and learning in the city of Hull. <laughs> 
a reputation it has continued to this day. The campus of Hull University has spread and this, which then passed into the hands of Humberside University, now is part of the campus of Hull University. These days, the heart of the old hamlet here at the Hereworth Junction is no longer the heart of Newland, even though it's still a busy intersection just as it always has been. That position as the heart of Newland goes to Newland Avenue. Its position, threading between the housing off Beverly Road and the avenues and dukeries, it naturally became the major shopping district of Newland. Even today, it's full of a wide range of shops and facilities, including butchers, bakers, takeaways, supermarkets, cafes, bars and restaurants. It's the beating heart of this community, even during the evening. But on an evening it is eclipsed by its southern neighbour, Princess Avenue. For many years during the 70s and 80s it was forgotten and somewhat decrepit, but it springs into vibrant life with a strip of popular bars that have made it one of Hull's main nightlife destinations for years and which brought much needed regeneration into the area. Just off Newland Avenue down DeGray Street is another nightlife destination, although of a slightly different kind. Now whilst this building behind me down DeGray Street might look like an end terrace house that's next to an old bomb site from the war, for much of its life it was that, but in 1984, it opened as the New Adelphi Club and it became one of Hull's most iconic and most enduring music venues. It's hard to believe when you look at it from the outside and to be fair, if you popped in for a pint, it'd probably be hard to believe from the inside too. And yet, this little place with its extension out the back has played host to bands like Pulp, Oasis, The Orb, Radiohead and The Kaiser Chiefs. And in fairly recent times too you know this isn't like a one flash wonder that used to be big in the 80s it's still going and it's still attracting the big names even to this day certainly it's become iconic in hull but it's also something of a national legend too in terms of punching above its weight it's a little bit like a flea knocking out mike tyson and it's all part of newland right here in the heart of it just off newland avenue Newland is a very different story to Skullcurse and Drypool. Its story is far more tied in with Hull's middle classes than with its working classes, and because of this we have some lavish and extravagant architecture in the houses of the avenues along Cottingham Road and Newland Park. And more recently, it's cemented itself as the heart of West Hull as a cultural, shopping and entertainment district, and being home to many of Hull's musicians, writers, artists and academics. But in many ways, this in itself is a working class victory because most of those musicians and artists and writers are not wealthy people. They're poor people who live in the avenues by dint of all of the flats that are there. And they've converted this once fairly stuffy middle class region into a thriving cultural capital in Hull, a place of music and art and culture. In many ways, the working class moved into this stuffy middle class suburb and transformed it into something quite special and within Hull, fairly unique. 